This is the More to the Story podcast with Dr. Andy Miller. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I'm so glad that you've come along. I'm Andy Miller, and I serve as the academic dean and professor of theology at Wesley Biblical Seminary, which is in the Jackson, Mississippi area. But just in case you're thinking, oh, I don't really want to come to Jackson, we have full online capacity. You could take classes right now. You could audit classes. We would love to have you learn more about how we are developing trusted leaders for faithful congregations all over the country. This is a part of what God has called us to. We are servicing the church in this way, and I'm really honored to be able to participate in this, and I'm thankful that Wesley Biblical Seminary serves as a sponsor for the More to the Story podcast. Today on the podcast, we have Dr. George Yancey, who serves as a professor of, the, of um, what is it, professor of Sociology, man, I almost said, kept on saying theology at Baylor University. He d- does a great job in this book. Some of you will know of his work on race, and that comes through in this interview as well. But he has a new book out called One Faith No More. And this book is really interesting because it analyzes from a sociological standpoint what has happened with Christian progressivism and Orthodox Christianity or conservative Christianity. And I'm, I'm not going to spoil it for you because I really want you to listen to that podcast. But it's a fascinating analysis, and I hope that you'll take time just to listen in to what he's saying because it really is a clear diagnosis for what's happening in our time, what's happening kind of in the milieu of culture, the culture, but also the way that impacts the church in the United States, particularly in the United States. I think there's ramifications for a global church as well. The More to the Story podcast is brought to you by WPO Development. Their CEO, Keith Waters, says that if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. And so what he does for churches, organizations, nonprofits, groups like the Salvation Army, is he comes alongside of them to help them develop a plan. Often that happens in a mission planning study, which leads to a strategic plan and finally culminates in a capital campaign. And he and his team have led more than 250 successful capital campaigns all around the country. And I can testify to their work. God has used them in my life. So I encourage and I commend them to you. You can find out more information at WPO Development. Just You could just even Google WPO Development or you can find some links in the show notes. Also, I'm really thankful to have Bill Roberts as a sponsor. Bill Roberts is a financial planner. He does a great job, particularly with people who serve in ministry, coming alongside of them to help them develop a plan for their own personal finances. So this comes in how he advises people with their investments and a variety of other things that he's able to do for you. You can find out more information about Bill at WilliamHRoberts.com. Bill is a pastor's kid, and he's uh, particularly gifted with working with people who are serve in the Salvation Army, either as staff or as officers in the Salvation Army. But if you're looking for somebody who comes at financial planning in from a Christian worldview, Bill is your guy. So I recommend you check out Bill at WilliamHRoberts.com. Now we'll get on to our interview. And I'm re- really pleased. And I want to just, with Dr. George Yancey, I want to thank my friend Gerald Waltz, Dr. Gerald Waltz, for helping me get connected here to uh, George, and I was really thankful and honored to have this conversation with him. I hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad to have you with us today. Thanks for checking this out. If you just take a minute and subscribe to this, if you're watching it on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button, or if you find what you hear today helpful, it helps us if you're able to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's, there's something with the ag- algorithms that makes it so that that just lifts up our profile so that people can find this easier. If you can use that or even sharing a link, that would be great. I'm thrilled today to have on to on the podcast somebody I've admired for a while from their work, and that is Dr. George Yancey, who serves as professor of sociology at Baylor University. Dr. Yancey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I, I first I now I know that your name gets confused with some other people, but I think I first came in touch with one of your uh, uh, the work you contributed to when I was in seminary, and, and forgive me if I have this wrong, was it United by Faith? Were you a part of that book? Yes, yes I was. Yeah, I and I I've, I've followed, I really was impressed by that book, and maybe we can talk about that after we talk about your current book too, but um, I've been aware of you through, through the years and your research, um, but this recent book that you have out is fascinating to me. It's called One Faith No Longer. And honestly, it's hard. <laughs> it's a hard book to, to, to stomach and to read because 
it's analyzing something that I think that we're all aware of, but it's this growing divide between progressive and conservative, or sometimes we say maybe orthodox Christian witness in the world. And so I'm, I, I want to just highlight like the end of your introduction, you lay out where, where things are going. And this isn't a theological study necessarily. It's not a, it's, it's like, kind of a, an indicative study. It's saying, what is, like, what has happened? Like, this is where things are from a sociological perspective. A lot of times we think about it from a cultural or political perspective, and you bring all that in. But you say at the very end, we argue that the distinction uh, between theological, theologically progressive Christians and conservative Christians is so great that at once you can't realistically think of them as the same religious group. Um, they're not, they're no longer one faith. Could you give us an idea for what you're trying to distinguish between these two groups? Yeah, because, you know, people talk about Christians as if they're a semi-monolithic group. And so we talk about Christian nation or Christian this or Christian that. And it's understandable because people are using the same term. But the distinctions between Christians really is tremendous. It's great. And as I've run around in circles of both conservative and progressive Christians, I just have noted that they are really talking about different things and that, and that the way they construct meaning is dramatically different, even though they use a lot of the same symbols. So that's kind of what I mean is that we have two groups within what's called Christianity in the United States today, and they are distinct from one another, so much so that the way they would answer what I call questions of meaning purpose, value, what is moral or not. It's so distinctive that they're realistically two different groups. They just have the same name at this point in time. Wow. Now, now I'm curious to this, you don't let your cards out very much throughout this study. It's more or less, again, just analyzing mm -hmm. what is like, you. I, I can't really figure out where you would land on some of this. And I think that's great. <laughs> um, but could you, could you tell us a little bit about your story and like how you arrived at this place to even study this in the first place, even your own academic and spiritual journey? Well, what well, was interesting because, uh, you know, originally when I came out of grad school, I studied racial issues. Okay. And, and then uh, about 10, 12 years ago, I switched because I was interested in issues on religion more and more so. And I was, you know, one of the things I've done is looked at issues of bias of anti-Christian attitudes. Right. And a particular study I was doing, I was looking in academia, I was looking at how academics feel about Protestants. And I noted that, you know, I, I looked at mainline Protestants and evangelical Protestants. And I noted that when the mainline Protestants talk about the evangelicals, they talked about them in ways that was very othering. Whereas the evangelicals, even fundamentalist Protestants, did not do that as much as the mainline Protestants. They, talked about them in ways that was, well, we disagree with them, but they're still part of our group. Interesting. And then I looked at how they rated each other. And I know that the mainline process, on a, we use this sort of what we call a thermometer variable, okay. like a zero to a hundred scale on how much you like a group. I know that the mainline process were rating the evangelical and fundamentalist process lower than other non-Christian groups. Interesting. The conservative, the, especially the evangelical process, Rating the mainline Protestants almost as high as they were rating evangelical. In fact, I don't think it was statistically different. Uh, so that fascinated me. And that got me thinking, wow, is it that the main, because we always hear about how the conservative Protestants, how, how, we, how much they reject other groups. And when it comes to non religious Christian groups, true. Yeah. But it got me thinking, are mainline Protestants? more rejecting of conservative process and vice versa. And that got me interested in studying this particular issue, which is conservative and progressive Christians. So what is it, what did you use to define uh, progressive Christians and um, conservative Christians? Like what, what, were there questions that would like make people land in certain areas? Yeah, so we use the theological definition. Okay. So, you know, Obviously, there's a relationship between theology and politics, but we didn't want to start off with a political definition. Our definition for a conservative Christian was one who believed both that the Bible was the word of God, right. you might say literal or, or however, and two, that Jesus Christ was 
the only way to salvation. Okay. What we call particularism. Yeah. We believe both of those. You know, I know there's other, you know, was it Bevington? Yeah, Bevington. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Bevington. Yeah. You know, so I know from a theological perspective, that's probably inadequate, but for our purposes, it served the purpose. On the other hand, if you denounce the Bible as the Word of God, a good book, but not the Word of God, not literal, not inerrant, and you do not see Jesus Christ as the only way, then you're a progressive Christian. So, and of course, there is something in the middle, but that's kind of how we define both groups. So, with those distinctions, then you're you're saying that the data suggests that because they have this different worldview altogether, mm-hmm. that yeah. it, it's not, it can't really sociologically be classified as the same religion. Right. Yeah. That's our argument. That's not the same religion. So what else, what else leads us? Cause I imagine that politics enters into this discussion. And I, mm-hmm. and I have, you know, read the book to understand like where, where you're going, but I'd love for you to unfold that for my audience here, like some of these other distinctions. So you have these theological distinctions, which makes it yeah. different, but then the politics seems to follow as well. Right. So, you know, as it concerns the politics, at first, honestly, when I did the quantitative stuff, I thought, okay, progressive Christians, they're into politics, progressive Christians, they're into theological theology. But when we did qualitative work, it wasn't that clear cut. What I find okay. is that politics matters. And in fact, in all honesty, you know, quantitatively and qualitatively, politics matters more for progressive Christians than for conservative Christians. But the way it wasn't that progressive Christians were going, all right, a progressive political ideology, we're worshiping that. What it was was that they valued what we would call social justice issues. So things such as inclusion, things such as equality these sort of general values. And generally speaking, they found these values more readily in progressive politics than in conservative politics. So it was, the politics was a means to an end. It wasn't an end in itself. Gotcha. For conservative Christians, the theological beliefs was an end in itself. That either you believe Jesus Christ is the salvation, or it's the only salvation, or you don't. So that was an end in itself in a way that politics was not for progressive Christians. So politics matters, but not quite in the way that I originally thought. Interesting. Now you also make in um, the in chapter three, you talk about the difference in how they handle legislation too. Like mm-hmm. there's like so politics matters and how you live things out, but there's also the sense that what uh, evangelicals do with their beliefs legislatively is different from the way that progressive Christians do that. Is that right? Yeah, so, right. And so that's the chapter where I was curious, you know, because we know that people who are theologically progressive tend to be politically progressive, and people with theological conservative tend to be politically conservative. But what happens on issues where they disagree with their base, their political base? And so I want to look at pro life on abortion, yeah. progressive Christians, and pro immigration reform, certain Christians. Sure. And what was interesting is that when conservative Christians talk about politics in ways that are contrary to their political base, they're more aggressive than progressive Christians. They're more willing to say, we need to change the laws. They're more willing, and, they, and in keeping with their, their, their sort of over, overarching morality, they use scripture to justify their political positions. Progressive Christians, while they will critique other progressives on abortion, do not tend to call for legal changes. And thus their critique is a little bit more careful. And part of what I think is that while politics is not what they worship, they value their political allies more than conservative Christians. Mm. Conservative Christians, if they believe that scripturally this political position is wrong, then they will go against their, their political allies. Mm. Conservative Christians are more careful to keep their political allies. And so, they will condemn abortion. They will say it's wrong. They will question it. But only a couple of them actually said we should change the laws. Hmm. I think almost every conservative Christian who was for immigration reform wanted legal changes. Wow. So yeah, so the way they look at politics, the way they deal with politics is very different. 
And so this is again, like defining the fact that these end up being like two different groups. They're, they're yes. like, they're, they're, they're functioning in, in two different ways. Now, some of you are already kind of ahead of me. Probably people who are listening are like, well, what does this mean for like groups where there's a distinction in denominations? And I want, I want to get to that about like how this works within denominations, because that's mm -hmm. something you break down too. But before I get there, I'm afraid I'm going to forget because this dovetails with your work on race. There, it seems like almost in <clears throat> vogue now to think about the distinction, like the, the Bebbington quadrilateral, I, and I'm kind of like a person who emphasizes 19th century and my own research. And so Bebbington is a guy who studied nonconformity nonconform, non in England. And so I'm really, I really like Bebbington mm -hmm. a lot and found him to be so helpful. And I think he was probably even surprised that this, these ways that he described evangelicalism became the theological system that people, you know, attach mm -hmm. this quadrilateral to his name. But if you were to take those points or even the two points you have, the African-American churches, which mm -hmm. in, at Wesley Biblical Seminary, interestingly enough, the Association of Theological Schools has told us we're the most racially balanced school uh, seminary in the country with 60% minority students, 40% white. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting, like we end up serving denominations that are all across, all across the board. And what I will find, and people come to us in part Minority students, particularly even from the black tradition, will come because they know that we are we we hold to those like kind of like the two points you said, but at the same time there might still be distinction in how that's li lived out. Like there wouldn't be the same. Um, there, there's just other they they wouldn't identify sometimes as I uh, evangelicals those denominations. I feel like I'm not expressing this very well, but I think you might know where I'm going. Like it seems like in African American churches, while they might line up theologically on the political sure. side, yeah. it would be someplace else. Yeah, and I think you're right. I, I, you know, I think you can look at uh, a lot of black traditions. They vote for Democrats, but theologically they're very conservative. I will say, and, and this is kind of interesting, while they will vote for Democrats, they vote for Democrats for different reasons than say a white progressive. Christian would, okay, and and I think that that's 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 one of the keys. What's happening, and so they don't tend to accept uh, some of the notions of uh, oh uh, rel relativism that you might find among some white progressive Christians. Right, uh, that they're not as eager to say that everyone is saved as you'll find in white progressive Christians. So. They uh, so they don't really fit well with them, but they vote for the same candidate. Uh, they're concerned about racial issues, racial justice is what's driving a lot of their vote. Mm. And, and so you know, it may be that part of what I'm looking at is a divide among white Christians. Okay. And where, where will the black Christians find themselves? I think that's an interesting question. I think that that's something worth further research. I can't give you a really good answer right now because that wasn't the focus of our study. But right. I think that this divide really becomes more pronounced and more people understand it more. Then that'd be interesting. Just one little side note. Yeah. While it was a small movement, there actually was a movement among African Americans towards the Republican Party in the last election. Right. So it is possible, depending on the candidate, I think, that you see more of a movement in, you know, in 2022, 2024 which might mean that those who are in a conservative Christian tradition are moving towards a conservative political tradition. Interesting. And that's a possibility. Yeah, once again, you want to look at the data and see, but I think that's an interesting possibility. And, and maybe I'm wrong. And, and you had some data on this too, talking about uh, election trends and our, our voting trends. I found mm -hmm. that so fascinating too. Um, so, uh, but even Donald Trump, and I'm trying not to, Hopefully, people just got to say a name doesn't mean I'm being political. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, he doubled in it. The, you know, he had very low numbers with uh, African American yeah. support, right? It's, maybe it's easy to double when it's so low, but yet, yet still increased significant. Is that the type of thing you're seeing across the board more than just for Donald Trump? Like that there was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, once, yeah, I know I like you. I don't want to get into the specifics of it because, you know, you say Donald Trump and then. Vote yeah. Down. I wonder, and of course I can't know this, I wonder if there'd been more of a movement if Trump wasn't at the head of the ticket. Right. Uh, you know, because I do think there's some issues that are resonating with African Americans, and I think that some of them are fearful of Trump. Now, people can say they shouldn't have been, or 
fine. I'm just saying that that's a perception that people have. And so I do wonder whether or not there would have been more movement if Trump had not been the top ticket, but he was. And so yeah. if he's not in 2024, then we'll, we may get a better answer to that question. Interesting. <clears throat> Now, uh, to the, the dominant denominational question, what you also highlight is that what we see happening with this distinction between progressive and conservative Christians is, isn't limited to denominations. And, and, and I really appreciate in the first chapter, your outlining of the history of these distinctions. And you, you highlight some, in my book, some of the most major you know, studies and things that have happened. So I feel like it's very thorough and like a historical theologian would like it a lot. Like, I think you've done a great yeah. job with that. So like, I, but as you've got there, you end up having this place where there is this distinction that has now, and you're talking about sociologically, move beyond the old lines of denominations. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. So, you know, like a hundred years ago, we were studying religion, Christian religion. Denominations would have been incredibly important. important. They, were, they were strong fault lines in which Christians stored it with themselves. And, you know, they, they, there were certain theological traditions associated with them. Around, I, I think around the 1970s or 80s, maybe a little bit 1990s, uh, some scholars began to write, look, denominations are not as important as they used to be. They are not identifying the denominations anymore. And we started seeing the rise of, say, non-denominational churches, inter interdenominational churches, and people start denominational hockey a little bit more, you know, within the same tradition. And so with any denominations, you have a conservative and a progressive tradition. Sure. That, that's finding it out. Uh, and so what that means for me is that, you know, another way in which I could look at progressive conservative Christians was denominational identity. But I felt that that was not that useful, given that denominational identity has less salience to the average Christian today. Right. That's that's the case in like what a lot of the content on my podcast in the past has been connected to my denomination, which mm -hmm. is the Salvation Army. And it's a very strange, uh, there's been a lot of people who've tried to sociologically analyze what we are, and it is a weird yeah. thing. <laughs> it's right. like, are we a ch church, sect? Are we, like, how do we fit in with this category? Are we a church? Um, mm -hmm. But one thing that's unique, about the Salvation Army from a polity standpoint is that our governance model is that we are an <clears throat> international denomination, the 133 countries mm -hmm. globally. So already we have huge distinctions amongst how we identify, but the, the question of sexuality has come up, maybe not with the same fierceness that it has with some denominations. Like we haven't divided yet mm -hmm. i'm sorry to yeah. say like say that word but whereas other denominations have divided for the last 40 right, years right. um but it's expressing itself now particularly like in um with country to country so western europe australia canada there's more uh, there's like an emphasis towards um uh, embracing some the form form. yeah yeah that's right but it's not it's, it's not it, it's cautious and the international leadership is doing its best i think to hold things together but i think in light of these other things that you're saying, the, the, the typical fault lines are, are coming there that are between these other questions of the uh, scripture being the word of God, Jesus being the way that people are saved. So I see this happening in my denomination. Um, we want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about the schisms in the Salvation Army to comment directly on that. Right. <clears throat> I will say that uh, sexuality is an interesting issue because it allows both sides to express themselves. In that, you know, all right, so what do we do with same-sex attraction, same-sex uh, sexuality, and that sort of thing? If you're a progressive Christian with these with these sort of humanistic ethic of social justice, right. what you value is tolerance and inclusion. And so you use that to interpret what you do with it. So it's not that you discard the Bible completely. You interpret the Bible in light of your values of inclusion and tolerance. And according to those values, you interpret the, now the Bible to what an affirming stance. Right. If you're a conservative Christian, it's not that you're intolerant or you don't, you know, you don't want to, you know, you, everyone has to be exactly like you. That would not be fair. But that tolerance is tamed in your mind by the scriptures. So when it comes to the issue of, of, of sexuality, what do you do? You, you go to the scriptures, you use your interpretation of that. And for most people, their interpretation of the scriptures in the conservative tradition is that this is wrong. 
and therefore it is sinful. So that is an interesting issue by which we can sort of distinguish how a progressive Christian would come at these issues as well as how a conservative Christian would come at these issues. Right. What I, what I found is that it's not, it's this, the sexuality is the way into the discussion mm -hmm. for many people. Um, yeah. And what I've, what I've done, and I've um, tried to have conversations with, with folks and even on, on this podcast too, um, and I have one that hopefully will come out soon, but I go through the Salvation Army has a article of articles of faith that everybody mm -hmm. agrees to at some point in their life, if they become what's called a member or a soldier in the Salvation Army. And I went through all of those uh, statements and I could say them in five minutes, like it's pretty quick. But if mm -hmm. I went through all there, there's classical uh, evangelical doctrines in the Wesleyan tradition, particularly. But what I find is I work through them. If there's 11 of those statements, probably half of them aren't affirmed by those who would be LGBTQ affirming. And then mm -hmm. the same thing's true with the other statements that, that we would have. What's what I can't quite get my finger on, maybe you can help me, is like people are so drawn to the group itself, mm -hmm. like that's their their home, even though they don't affirm what they what the articles are that define the group, it's like they still want to be a part of it. Um, and I imagine this is happening in other denominations as well across Christianity. I think it's probably connected to the conflict yeah. that you articulate. Yeah, there's probably, you know, there's residue, uh, residual denominational identity issues that's happened. So you grew up in, say, the United Church of Christ, and you want to, you know, that's part of your identity. And even if your beliefs change, you, you, will, you will tend to join those churches. So there, there probably is some of that. It's just that we, we now know that the way in which people uh, define their values is a lot less than denominations than it right. was before. You also, in the uh, sixth chapter, you, you do a real analysis of the way that um, progressive Christians look at Jesus. Jesus mm -hmm. and, and and like the distinctions that people have in how they understand Jesus because a lot like it's a popular thing to say and I tried to be like this isn't exactly a a, a dramatic or a Martin Luther type of moment but I noticed nobody on Twitter is saying like their first line they're not saying I'm a Christian nobody say I'm a Jesus follower right and so yeah. every and so I I decide I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm just a straight up Christian right um, yeah. but but even that title is distinct so <clears throat> the way liberal progressive christianity and conservative christianity talk about jesus that's distinct too and you analyze that yes. can you talk to us about that a little bit yeah so for conservative christians jesus is the son of god jesus is you know uh he is part of god you know how the trinity works out yeah to be deified and because the christians greatly respect jesus they, they greatly respect him as a, as a fantastic teacher and, and some will say he's the son of God. So let me just be, right, right. We're not talking about people who are atheists, right? Who are Christian. But uh, just like the Bible is to be respected, uh, Jesus is to be respected. But the notion of uh, there's less this notion of this sort of personal relationship dynamic than than you would normally find among certain Christians. And more of that, he's this great model for us to follow. Right. Uh, and, and so that is kind of, you know, a, you know, it's a difference that emerges out of these different perspectives on the nature of what Christianity is. Is it, is it the one true religion or, and the Bible is the, the holy arbiter of that religion, or is it not? And because Christians say it's not. Mm. So one of the things to you helped me with was thinking about how these how both groups see each other, mm -hmm. and uh, that was helpful to me. And again, again, it's kind of hard to read at times, but it's uh, but I think what it's doing is it's laying out probably what the real experience that many people have on both sides. So so can you tell, how is it that conservative Christians and you've addressed this a little bit already, but I just want to give some like give a, some focus to it um how is it that conservative christians view uh progressive christians they tend to of course you know yes. these are tendencies this is you know i want to make sure i'm not saying every single conservative christian does this i want to talk about progressive christians but i'm talking about every single progressive christian your tendencies 
they tend to see progressive Christians as another kind of Christian that they kind of disagree with, uh, a little bit weaker Christian, they're, they're not as strong in the faith, but they're still in the fold per se. So, uh, so they disagree with progressive Christians, but they, they still consider progressive Christians as part of what we call their in-group. Okay. You know, they're still with us, they're still identified as Christians. So that's how conservative Christians see it. Uh, progressive Christians, looking at conservative Christians, uh, they, they uh, are much harder on conservative Christians. Uh, they see conservative Christians as intolerant, sometimes bigoted, sometimes ignorant. Uh, they generally don't want much to do with them, mm -hmm. and they generally distance themselves from them. And part of this may be that they both share the term Christian, but they have these different beliefs. Progressive Christians know better the differences between conservative Christians and themselves than the other way around. Okay, yeah. Their Christians, you know, they tend to think, well, there's not much difference between, you know, we worship a little bit differently. They, they baptize their infants and we don't or something like that. Right, sure. They don't appreciate just the schism that's there. And this is one of the reasons why progressive Christians have a lower regard for conservative Christians and vice versa. Hmm. So it, the, the idea of the in-group, is that a, like a, a term that's often used in uh, sociological studies? Pretty much, yes. So that the idea is like uh, conservative Christians tend to see progressive Christians as being a part of the in-group. And they, they, right. the, the distinctions you're saying, like they, they don't value them. But on the other side, and that's probably like hmm. progressive Christians are much uh, de more demeaning at times or s separating themselves. Now, of course, this isn't, I'm not saying if you're a progressive Christian, you're listening, it's like I say, yeah. I'm not that. Anecdotally, I know exceptions to all of these things, certainly, but mm -hmm. uh, but on the stats as a whole, <clears throat> that's where we're, we're saying that that's what that this distinction is. You bring up this term. Did you want to comment on that? Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I think that's good. I, I'm trying to make sure, I want to make sure I got it. The, um, the term Christian. <laughs> This is the one that's going to be interesting. Um, will, if, if these are two different religions, sociologically, mm -hmm. what's going to happen with the term Christian? I know, I know I'm asking you now to do something yeah. different outside right. your study, but I can't help but go there. And I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, and of course, you know, uh, my thoughts are my are predictions and, and I don't claim to have to get the prophecy. So <laughs> I take them for what they are. Uh, I think that because they're growing and their numbers are at least stable as a percentage of the population, whereas progressive Christians are not, then eventually conservative Christians will be, will take on the label of Christian Christians much more than progressive Christians. Okay. Uh, and I think that they'll, at that point, there'll be more delineation as to the two different types of religious movements. So that would be my guess. Uh, now, the one thing progressive Christians do have going for them is that they tend to be more in positions of cultural power. Okay. Christians. So they may be able to hold on to this title and more that way. But I think at some point, they just get tired of being associated with these people that they don't like, and thus they'll create new titles for themselves. So you think that that's what will eventually, if it stays on this track, yeah. It'll just create a different way to describe themselves. So, for instance, um, within U United Methodism, the split that's coming there from a group that's called the Wesleyan Covenant Association is birthing a group called the Global Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. Whereas the um, uh, the one of the liberal versions that's coming about, progressive versions called like um, I think it's called the Li Liberation Connection, mm -hmm. and it uses the mm -hmm. old English spelling of <clears throat> connection. So like those are pretty different different ideas. I don't yeah. I don't think either is giving up the term Christian mm -hmm. yet, but it seems like that's what your study points to is like it's gonna have to get to a place where we say this is um for for the sake of like we, we're existing within different worldviews. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll get to that. How how exactly looks you know is is, is a good question. Uh, you know, you can look a little bit on how. Buddhism and Hinduism just is separate from each other. Right. So will it happen somewhat like that, or will it be a more uh, abrupt undertaking? I, I, you know, I can't answer those questions, but those are interesting questions to ask. Yeah. I do think that this current situation is not sustainable. 
Right. That conservative Christians are in fact growingly staying steady, whereas Christians are shrinking. I think at some point, in the, at least in the United States, at some point there's going to be some effort to sort of link each other on each other. Now, it, you brought up something too. It's the second time you brought up like the nature of the growth of conservative Christianity and the decline of mainline mm-hmm. Christianity, progressive Christianity. This is a, interesting to me, and I, I, I maybe missed this in your book, but is there data to show that, uh, this is my anecdotal observation, that mm-hmm. it seems that people who have moved towards uh, progressive Christianity come from evangelical Christianity. Mm-hmm. Like they, they're, they're there in evangelical Christianity, and then they get kind of evangelized, yeah, right, in, yeah. I would say, in reverse to progressive Christianity. And then some of them, it's like that's a gateway drug sometimes to atheism. And um, so, it, but is that, is it, I don't see progressive Christians bringing in, or pres- progressive tr- Christian church bringing in non-Christians, so to speak. Right. Is, is, there, is there data for that? or that? I don't have any data for that per se. Progressive Christians, though, de-emphasize, de-emphasize proselytizing. So they're, they're not likely to go to an atheist meeting and try to convince them to come join them. Right. So if atheists are joining progressive Christians in larger numbers because they're choosing to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's just a pure fact. Like, if you don't think people need to be saved, why would you want to invite them to your church? Yeah. <laughs> I remember being on a panel uh, one time at a, a community college, and I was a, a representing uh, evangelical Christianity in my Salvation Army uniform there. And yeah. I realized that I was the only person uh, on the panel who actually, I, I went ahead and said it. Like I actually would like for everybody else on this panel to become a Christian. <laughs> yeah, like that's part of like what what I affirm the uh, scripture. I, I that's my desire. Now I'm not. I'm still here in a civil dialogue, but I act. My theology is such that I believe that yeah. I want everybody to be a Christian. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Would you like to comment on that? Oh, no, go ahead. Um, I'm interested too. Like one thing that you. <clears throat> help me with with your other work and i've heard this more through interviews with you but because i i haven't i haven't read all of your works on race i've just kind of dabbled a little bit but you emphasize and i wonder if there's a a perspective for this for the liberal conservative divide Mm -hmm. uh within racial conversations the concept of of mutual obligation yeah could you talk about like how you've used that in talking about race and then maybe we can use it as a way to transition to think about how conservatives and liberals can communicate. Sure. So collaborative conversations or, or mutual responsibility approach is that everyone is responsible for entering into the conversation, for not just talking, but listening, for learning how to communicate effectively, how to listen well, active listening. And at the end of the day, then once we see the perspectives from, from, a, from a lot of different stakeholders, we can find solutions that maximize everyone, what everyone wants. So win-win instead of win-lose solutions. In a nutshell, that's what it's about. Could it apply here? Yes, but only if conservative Christians and progressive Christians see a need to produce such a need. As long as they don't see such a need, then no, it won't happen either. Mm. In, in, in the racial discussion, like what you'd like to see is like, people to still hold these values, like say if it's related to issues on systemic racism or the like, like they come together, but yet to recognize that there's an importance in hearing one another and listening mm-hmm. and trying to come up with common solutions. Is, is that yeah. a good summary? Of like, Yeah, that's, that's somewhat, yeah. That we talk past each other. We try to get people to come aboard our ideas and not have to deal with their ideas. And then uh, basically we get enough people on board, we can get what we want politically, legally, what have you. But of course that doesn't, that doesn't work because if you do that, then the other side is going to constantly plot to sabotage you. Mm. So that's why, you know, using cloud conversations to create better solutions is a much better way to go about it. I'm 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 curious where things are gonna. I know I'm I'm asked, I'm not asking you to prog- uh, to provide like analysis of where the what's what's going to be in the future. But that's part of like what I'm wondering. It's like I think what you you've hit on is exactly where we are. That we've 
we have two different religions. And I, I, the first where I, place I heard this was uh, um, Gresham, uh, Gresham Mason. Um, <coughs> it's so that he, by, by talking about like if people don't affirm the resurrection or the authority of scripture, really like you, you don't just have two denominations, but you have different, mm -hmm. different religions. And that was uh, many years ago that he said that. So I started, but I've been hesitant to say that because it almost sounds like it is a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I do think it's true. I think I think yeah. that that's um, is would that even bringing that up that we we see that we see the world differently be a part of that type of conversation? Yeah, and so you're going to understand that when you have a productive conversation with someone, because now you, you're not just fitting your stereotype on them; you're hearing them out, and in active listening, you're able to articulate what they believe in a way that they feel yes, that's what I believe, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a different from the sort of stereotype we put on those who we disagree with. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious too, um, what, what are some other things you're, you're working on now? I mean, you have this book that's come out that's articulated what a lot of us have, have felt. Is this, is this something you're going to keep studying, um, the nature of this divide? Yeah, I am going to keep studying it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to do some research to see whether or not cloud conversations is a good way to, to heal this divide. And so I'm in the middle of trying to find that research right now. Uh, but I do think that, uh, that this sort of schism, this sort of polarization to the heart of why we have such racial problems today. Yeah, is there, and, and you have a book coming out on this, on the racial yes. side of this guy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that project? I know it's different from the, this, right, this other yeah. book we're talking about. It's called Beyond Racial Division. And uh, you know, it builds on my 2006 book. I'm, I'm bringing in more research. I'm, well, I'm going to discuss a theological aspect and relegating that to one chapter so that you can give to anyone and just say, skip the theological chapter and read the rest. Okay. Uh, you know, Times Have Changed is my first book. It was written in 2006. So, so sometimes some things have changed and so I'm adjusting to that. Uh, also, I wanted to try to start a movement away from what we're doing today, which is not working towards something new, which is these sort of collaborative conversations. Oh, that is great. I'm excited for that to come around. Now back to the, the, the first way I was introduced to you, United by mm -hmm. Faith. Yeah. That book had an idea. Now I know it's, that's a long time ago, but I'm curious of like, I, I've seen that that book was inspiring to me to see a multiracial congregations and answer to problems. Um, yeah of race uh, and racial tensions. Um, it, but I've, I, and, and I've been in, in, in the Salvation Army in the United States, by and large, is multiracial at the grassroots roots level. Uh, it's different when you get people in leadership and that ends up changing like dynamics and there's a lot involved there. But uh, I've, also, I've also known like that that was an emphasis in the early 2000s that maybe is moved away from that now in light of like cultural needs that people have. Like there, there were churches that mm -hmm. combined and yeah. they combined for five to 10 years and have separated. Now that's anecdotal. I'd be curious in your reflections on United by Faith now, that book, United by Faith, 20 years later. Yeah, I mean, I, I was fortunate to be able to work on that project. Uh, I think of that book, because I wasn't the head author, the head author was a theologian. And so that book's a little bit more the, the, Theological yeah. in my work. I mean, we we do bring in a social scientist, some of the uh, research angle, but that's a little bit more theological. Uh, when we wrote that book, it's not that people were against interracial churches, it's just that there weren't that many out there, and people didn't know what to do in order to produce them, or they didn't want to do what they needed to do in order to produce them. I think the situation is different today. While there's still not enough, from my point of view, there's a lot more out there, and you have more and more people who are experiencing handling these different cultures. And so, you know, it, it is, it, I think it's an important book of its day. I'm not sure it's aged well simply because we have more acceptance than we used to have of interest with, um, within the body of Christ. Yeah. It's, it seems like there is a, um, like, I'll say like, uh, example for me like, so I'm, I'm teaching preaching this semester mm -hmm. and like yeah. i said we're one of the association of theological schools that says we're one of the most balanced mm -hmm. that are the most balanced 
school, an association of theological schools. So in my class, I have people who are in all white denominations and all black yeah. denominations. And yeah. so I'm figuring out, like I'm making sure that I have resources available for each one. And it's caused me to reflect. And, and, and I then come from a denomination that has a, has a mix, is multiracial. Yeah. But yet I'm, I'm aware of the different needs that are there. And like uh, the, the book that came before United by Faith, Divided by Faith, highlighted that it's a tragedy the the mm. hour, sunday morning is the most segregated hour in the in the time in the country so i'm not i'm not always sure that that's i don't know help me here as particularly as an african-american yeah. man it, like always a bad thing like i'm thankful yeah. for the my students that are come from african-american traditions and what they can bring to white students yeah. and vice versa yeah uh in the black tradition, the church was the center of cultural power at one point. And so it had a much more central position. And for some African-Americans, the church is a way in which they can express their, their, their racial longing, their position they're in. And so, so I think there's gonna be some resistance among African-Americans to the multiracial congregation. Not among all, maybe even not among most, but that tradition is there. In a way, it's really is not been for, for European Americans. Hmm. And so I, I think that's what European Americans need to understand about the black church is it was the place in which our political leaders could go. It was the place in which we could organize. It was an incredibly important place for African Americans. Right. And, and, and if we were to say we all need to combine right now, hmm. we would miss right. that cultural legacy. Yeah. yeah I, I, I was, even though I'm an advocate of multiracial churches, I would say that the strongest argument against them is cultural maintenance, especially among the smaller racial groups. Cultural maintenance. Help me understand what that means. To, to be able to have your culture and to keep it going on. Okay. So, so, so you don't lose your culture. Uh, you know, people of color are worried of losing their culture. Native Americans were forced into kids at boarding schools. Kids came back and they no longer were culturally Native Americans. So there's that fear that's out there right. uh, among people of color. And so that would be, I think, a subtle reason to oppose multi churches. I still think the pause is vast that way to make this, but I can understand that maybe. Yeah. Have you participated in a multiracial church yourself? Is that a part of your experience? We're going to one right now, yes. Okay. Yeah. And and so you just see the positives in that in your own personal experience that well, I, I don't just see the positives, but I do see positives. Oh, did I say just? Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I you, you did. Maybe I'm wrong. We're being video taped, so we'll know soon. Okay, it's good. I'm sure I make those mistakes, those type of mistakes yeah. a lot. So I'm glad, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that emphasis and it's helped me have to, and I think a little bit of that's like the cultural maintenance idea, that's what's behind the liberal conservative divide in the Salvation Army is people want to stay mm -hmm. in because the Salvation Army has to form itself as a distinct culture, almost yeah. as a nation. Like we yeah. wear uniforms, there's flags, there's a certain type of music and how we define ourselves is like, Okay, well, I don't affirm any of the theology anymore, but this mm. is my culture. This yeah. is my my people group. This is my my in group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. And so the Salvation Army may have a stronger denominational identity than other denominations right now. And that may keep them together a little bit longer. Right. Well, it is an interesting place to see, particularly as other denominations make make switches and like this becomes more nuanced as people live out their work. Yeah. Well, it's been so great to have time with you. Um, I've, I've heard of you for a long time now, and it's helped me. And it, like your concept of mutual obligations and conversation has been, and it's been really helpful to me as we've worked through this time, particularly in the last mm. two years. So thank yeah. you for your scholarship and your work. Well, thank you. I, the, 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 this podcast is called More to the Story, and I try to ask a question to see if there's something that's a, beyond somebody's academic work or they're kind of the thing that they're on to talk about. Is there more to the story of George Yancey that we haven't heard that people don't normally hear? Well, uh, you know, I've gotten into cycling, although I'm, I'm not a maniac about it, and I have three very young kids. Okay. Three young boys, and so they eat up a lot of my time. But this morning, you know, I was able to do some cycling. And, and uh, you know, I find for me, as I've gotten older and my knees don't let me to run or play basketball anymore, that, that uh, cycling is just the right speed. Okay. In your car, like for, for the sport, I went by some houses and there's Halloween decorations. 
when you're in a car, you're going too fast. You can't see them. When you're walking, you know, it's like you're walking. I think yeah. Better to get there. But for me, it's like it's just the right speed to like enjoy that or other things I see and then move on. Oh, so, fine. So, yeah, so, I, so that's been a little bit more to my story. How old are your boys? Six, four, and three. Wow, you are in the yeah, heart of it right now. I am. Wow. Yeah. I have two boys, 14 and 12, and uh, and then I have a girl who's 10. Um, just north of us here at Wesley Biblical Center, we'll have to have you come at some point. We have the Natchez Trace Trail, which is a very sought-after bike trail that goes mm. all the way from Nashville down here to Mississippi. So we'll have to have very you. interesting, yeah. Come sometime. Well, thank you so much for your time and coming to this podcast. And um, could tell people about where they could find out more about you and this work, and um, and if, if they want to explore some more of your research, where could they find that? Well, my website is www.georgeyancyalloneword.com. Be sure when you spell Yancy, put an E to the C and the Y because there's another George Yancy out there. And he's a nice enough guy, but we don't, you know, we're not the same person. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. And of course, you have, you have uh, Philip Yancy too, another there's, favorite. There's that, yeah. There's actually another George Yancy who's in psychology, but we don't get confused because he's white and he doesn't study race. Whereas the oh, other okay. one, I can use it as, a, as an African American that means states, he's a philosopher of race relation. Wow, I'm sure. Yeah. Have you have you all met face to face yet? No, uh, I don't know if we even talk on the phone, but we have email back and forth. Because I get his emails and he gets mine. Right. Well, I'm Andy Miller the third, and I have my oldest son's the fourth, and mm -hmm. the, we're all all been in the Salvation Army. And then there's another Andy, but I, I get I'm I'm forwarding a lot of emails. We'll say that, so I, yeah. I understand how that works. Yeah. Thank you again for your time, Dr. Yancey. Thank you and God bless.